We're so glad you plugged in today online at Cornerstone Church. Each message is designed to strengthen your walk with Christ. However, we do encourage you to be a part of a loving church home where you can build real relationships with real people and grow in your walk with Christ. We hope this message blesses you and we can't wait to see you next weekend. about it. How many of you in here by a show of hand actually like receiving gifts? All right, who doesn't, right? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But getting a gift from somebody is just special. It lets, they, it lets you know that they think about you. You know what I mean? And by a show of hands, how many of you have ever received a gift that you just did not open? Because the reality is, is that we just don't do that. Nobody has a storage shed full of gifts that just are not open or a closet full of gifts that are just not open. In fact, the 196 kids that are going to receive the, your shoebox gifts uh, are not just going to take them and put them on a shelf. They're going to open them. And that's part of the excitement about receiving a gift is that we get to open it. And for those of you who are destructive, you get to rip open over the paper. Um, and then you get to see what's inside, not knowing what it is. And well, if you're married, most of us, we just kind of hint all the time. Is we pretty much know what it is. But for the most part, sometimes we just don't know what it is. And, and it's great to see if it's something we can use in our lives, if it's something that we can uh if it's practical, if it's something we've always wanted, if I can catch a fish on it, or if it's just socks. Um, the reality is, is that it's extremely fun and exciting to open a gift. Now, if you're here with us today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, our hope and our prayer is that you would by the end of today, and he would change your life forevermore. And if this is you here today, I have a question for you. What if I told you that there was such thing as a gift that keeps on giving? What if I told you that there was a gift that will continue to give many gifts? And what if I told you that you can receive a gift every single day of your life? Would you believe me? See, we don't wrap a gift without the intention of giving it away. In fact, nobody uh, buys themselves a gift and wraps it and then five minutes later opens it up. And if you do that... At the close of service, please come talk to me because I think that's really weird and, and, and exciting at the same time. I want to know what the motive is behind that. But the average person does not just wrap a gift and keep it for themselves. When we wrap a gift, we have every intention on giving it away to somebody. Now think about this. A sovereign, holy God has wrapped himself in flesh and died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And on the third day, he rose in victory. That's a big Big deal. A sovereign holy God had wrapped himself in flesh and died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we were given the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sp speaking of the, the word, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 11 through 14. That's Luke chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. I always like hearing pages turn. All right, let's get started. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great, multitude, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. We're in a series right now called The Gift of Gifts, and today we're going to look at how Jesus is, in fact, the gift of peace. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to wake up today. We thank you so much for your grace and the, and the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that we can have a relationship with you, that you are a good, good father, and that you are a God of many gifts. But Lord, I, I know that with the Christmas season coming, there are those who are going to be hurting. There are those who are worried about getting gifts but have financial struggle. There are those of us who are in here today that are just don't have peace. And so, God, I just ask that your peace would, that passes all understanding would fall and manifest itself in our lives here today. 
Father, use your word today as we feast on your word that we would walk away here with, with peace in our hearts. And I want to ask that we would open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have here today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said. <clears throat> now, in my study, this has really changed the way this is the way I look at this is painted such a beautiful picture, and I want to share this with you. When it says a great company, the Hebrew word that actually describes that actually means a multitude that cannot be counted. And heavenly host, the Hebrew word that is described here is, is it describes an army. And so let's read this again within this context. This changes everything and it really paints us such a beautiful picture of what these shepherds have actually seen on this night. This is not a little thing that's taken place. This is a big, big deal. And we're going to see this. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great multitude that cannot be counted of, a hem- of the hem- heavenly army appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So let's, let's take a look at this. And the shepherds are, they're, they're, they're about to bed down and an angel appears to them and they make a, an announcement and a birth announcement. And immediately after this announcement was made, an army of the angel, an army of heaven appeared in a multitude that cannot be counted. Now, if you're sitting there and you're looking at this and you're looking at a bunch of heavenly angels just all over the place and you just can't even count them and they just lay out a shout of praise and a shout of victory and they're celebrating. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine how loud that must have been? And so what were they shouting for victory over? What were they celebrating well, for one, a soldier shouts when there's victory. And, there was a, and on this day, a Savior was born. And then they were shouting because the victory over sin and death will be done forevermore through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we have that hope. That is our hope. Everything that we could ever want, everything that we could ever hope for is in Jesus Christ. In the Bible, peace, the actual word peace is mentioned 263 times to 428 times, depending on the translation. The Apostle Paul, when he uh, began his epistles, often started with this, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my question to you today is, is do you have peace? Do you have peace with your life? Do you have the peace that with 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 where you're at in life, do you have peace with yourself? Do you have peace with your job? Do you have peace with your siblings? Do you have peace with your family? Do you have peace with God? You know, I find that there are three factors if if you don't have peace. And all of us, we have ebbs and flows in life. So we're in peaks and valleys of life. and, And so we have good times and we have bad times. But there are three things that contribute to us not having peace. And they are fear, anxiety, and worry. Fear, anxiety, and worry. And I find that these all, and I find that more often than not, these all kind of work together. You can't be fearful about something and not worry about something. And then, and then a lot of times it leads to anxiety. You can't, you can't be worried and, and not be fearful. They all work together. And we live in a world today that gives us every reason to be full of fear, worry, and anxiety. You can see that, I mean, there's wars, there's, there's civil unrest, there's poverty, terrorist organizations, and the list goes on. I was uh, talking to my wife on, on Thanksgiving Day, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a shopper, okay? I don't know about deals. I'm not too much concerned to care about deals, but my wife is. And so she paid attention to what's going on on Black Friday. And did you know that Black Friday, on Black Friday, the stores began to open up early on Thanksgiving so they can get their sales and stuff in? Now, can you imagine what the world is doing now? Every, the world is, is so after your attention that the world is governing how you spend time even with your family. Think about this. I know for a fact that there were some families that did not have peace on Thanksgiving. 
a time where we're just supposed to be together and to be unified and to love one another and just share a meal and talk and get to know each other and to catch up. The world says we're going to open up our stores, and, and I can only imagine what that looks like. Hey, guys, we're going to have dinner at 1 o'clock and at 1.30, so you better eat quickly. We're going to go hit the stores because i got to catch the deal. And then you're in the hustle and bustle of of this whole Black Friday trying to get it, and you just cannot even enjoy the day with your family. What a tragedy it is. Everything in this world tells us to have fear, anxiety, and worry. But Jesus says something different. In Matthew 6, 25 through 27, he says, he says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. That's a commandment. He is telling us, do not do it. He is commanding us not to worry about our life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And so here Jesus is telling the disciples, he's saying, look, God cares about the birds and the bees and the trees and the grass, and he's going to take care of those things. Are you not more valuable than them? And he's telling you, do not worry about what you're going to eat. Do not worry about what you're going to wear. Do not even worry about your life, and don't even worry about your body, because our God who is in heaven is going to take care of all of your needs. And Jesus is... Jesus here, he's just so smart. He says, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? In fact, when we worry, it doesn't add anything to our lives. It takes away from our lives. And in, in, in the area of uh, medicine and scientific research, this is an actual study, and this is some symptoms of what worrying and stress does to the body. Mental health problems, depression, personality disorders, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythms, heart attacks, stroke, obesity, and other eating disorders, and the list goes on. And this is what worrying does to the body. It restricts us from actually having the abundant life that Jesus has came and said that we could even have. And in Matthew 6, through 34, he says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And there it is. He's commanded us again to do not worry. What are you worried about today? Are you worried about your employment? Are you worried about your kids? What is it that worries you? Jesus even defines what worry is. And it's having fear or anxiety of something that hasn't even happened yet. How many of us have laid awake at night worrying about something that we, that just hasn't even happened yet? I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning thinking about, I'm being honest, I just woke up at 2 o'clock this morning trying to, just thinking about stuff and I couldn't turn my brain off thinking about all kinds of things. I don't know if it was worry or not. I tried to go back to sleep, but it didn't happen. (laughs) But Jesus says it two times, so it must be important. When Jesus says something twice, he's really trying to get our intention, and and, and he really wants us to live in a way that we do not worry, that we fully trust him, that we can really have peace in Jesus, because no matter what comes our way, he's always there. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, for I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, not plans to harm you, but to prosper you and to give you a future and a hope. Why are we so worried? There's no reason to. Look, I have a daughter, and and I know most of you in here have kids. We worry about their future with the condition of the world today. I I got one that we can all relate to. When you pass a cop, all of a sudden you just begin to worry. You haven't even gotten a ticket yet, and you're worried about if you're going to get a ticket. You don't even start. You start looking at the, you just look. You don't even pay attention to the road. You're looking, and you're just driving. Do I got got my seatbelt on? You try to try to slip it as if he's, I mean, he's eight cars back. He hasn't even, and you're trying to, and, and, and you can even turn the corner and you're still looking. You're just wondering, do, am I going to get a ticket today? We worry about things that, does, that haven't even happened yet. 
When we call our spouse, when we call our wives, and they don't respond, we, we start losing it a little bit. We start worrying. Are you okay? Are you dead? Do you like me? Do you not like me? Are we getting a divorce? I mean, we just, we, <laughs> we're going to switch that one. <laughs> we're going to keep it moving from that one. <laughs> I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> she may not like me, but we ain't going down that road. And then when she finally responds, all she says was, is, listen, I was busy at work. You see, we worry about things that really we don't need to be worried about. But what we really need to be worried about is, is are we in step with Jesus? What we need to be worried about is, are we growing in the Lord? What we need to be worried about is the homeless. What we need to be worried about is the orphan. What we need to be worried about is the widow. What we need to be worried about is the spiritual condition of each other. This is church. This is the body. This is the peace of God. And sadly, the pharmaceutical companies are making billions and billions of dollars off of our worries, off of our stresses, and off of our anxieties. And I can't speak for the world because, listen, they don't know no better. So I, you, we can't even judge them. It's not even for us to judge. In fact, Jesus is going to come back a second time. He's going to judge them. That's not for us to judge. So if they do what they do. But for the Christian today, going to the doctor get to get happy pills to make them feel better about themselves. And listen, these pills and these medications, they have all kinds of side effects. You've seen the commercials. You got one medication that targets one symptom, and yet they have a whole list of symptoms that are going to create a whole bunch of different problems for yourself. Your eyes are going to fall out. The stomach might, might fall out. Your leg will fall off. You're going to hemorrhage out of your eyes and your ears. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. You'll have heart attacks, hallucinating, suicidal thoughts. And if that's you here today, there's no doubt that you don't have peace with your life. But I consulted the great physician, and I have a perfect prescription for you. Not a prescription, but a prescription. And that's in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, every single situation, you can't think of a situation that this will not work, that this will not give you life, that this will not give you hope. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Now remember, prayer is not just talking to God. It's allowing God to talk to you, getting in his word, getting in the quiet place. Now I'm not saying that God does not answer foxhole prayers because he has. I remember one time I was... I was uh, working non-emergency, non-emergency medical transport, and uh, we were transferring. Tra- we were out in Port Orange, and we brought someone to hospice, and we had another call in Daytona, so it wasn't worth us coming back here. And I forgot my wallet, and I was hungry, and uh, and so I just, in my mind, I just prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I mean, I'm starving. You know, I'm in the gym. I mean, I gotta eat. You know, I gotta feed my body, and and so uh, I got the whole work place fishing so there was a hole there we bought our poles and we started fishing just to kill the time and he said and my man my man Alex that was working with he we were fishing there on the bank and there was this algae mat that was right here and he says look at that look at that and I'm not lying to you there was $15 in <laughs> laying right on the algae mat just laid on top of each other now you telling me that God doesn't answer foxhole prayers come on <laughs> all right but when we're talking about prayer, but when we're talking about prayer, we're talking about real, intimate, relational prayer with God. With prayer, petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Everybody say that, in Christ Jesus. In every situation, prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. Prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. And if you don't have peace today, if you're facing uh, trouble, if you're facing heartache, the ways of life are coming to crash on your boat. Prayer, peace, and thanksgiving. Which brings us to our first point. In Jesus, in Jesus, we are can have the peace of God. Don't worry, I only got two points. We're not going <laughs> to, 
Just thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, we may actually get out of here early, and all God's people said. Isaiah 9, 6 says this, For us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. That should give some of you some peace right now. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now listen, names mean something. Your name means something. Maybe not as much as it did back in the day, but names back in the day and names even today mean something. If I say Bill Gates, what comes to mind? This isn't an NA meeting. You can, you can speak. Microsoft, billions. When I say Michael Jordan, what comes to mind? Goat. Goat. Yeah, absolutely. When I say Kevin Key, what can, no. <laughs> Wait, let's not go there. <laughs> Keep that one to yourself. My point is that names mean something. I found this to be so powerful uh, when I studied the word peace here. And this Hebrew word that describes uh, peace, it's, it's called shalom, and, and, and what this means is, is is a realm where chaos is not allowed to enter. Let's bring this back into context. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of the realm where chaos is not allowed to enter. This is our God. We have everything we could ever hope for that we could ever want in Jesus Christ. And it's, it's not just something, peace is not just something that, that he gives. He says, I leave you my peace. It's who he is. He embodies peace. He didn't just create it. It's who he is. He is our peace. He is our portion. And until Jesus is all that we have is when we will finally realize that Jesus is is all that we need. When we were praising God earlier in worship and in song, we were in the presence of peace. When we took communion, you were in the presence of peace. You were consulting peace. When we took our tithes and our offerings, you were giving back to peace. And even now, we're in the presence of peace with Jesus Christ. We have, we have God the Father, we have God the, or God the Son, and we have the Trinity. Everything we could ever need and hope for is in Jesus Christ, and that is including peace. John 16, says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In who? In me. Who is me? Jesus Christ. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's a contrast here. Jesus says that in me you will have peace, but in this world you will have trouble. I often get asked all the time, if God is so loving and he's so caring, why do we face trouble in this world? The answer is simple. First three chapters of Genesis, you can get your answer. Sin answered the world. We live in a fallen world. We became enemies with God. But on the other hand, if we didn't face trouble, if we didn't have heartache, if we didn't, if we didn't face any kind of trials or tribulations or storms, whatever you want to call them, how would we really be able to experience and to know who God really is? And, and it shouldn't be a shocker to us that we face trouble because Jesus said it. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's a, without a shadow of a doubt. But there's going to be a time where Jesus comes back and we will not have to worry about it because we're going to be in the presence of the one true king. We're going to live in his peace. We're going to live in his glory in heaven for all eternity for those of us who have confessed and believed that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. Take a few seconds and give God some praise over that. But he's so good. He's so good to us that he says, listen, I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to give you my son to help you walk through this journey called life, and you are not alone. And in fact, because Jesus is peace and he is our peace, we can walk through the storms of life, and we can remain and stay in the eye of the storm. You know, it's fascinating that uh, sharks, when it, when it starts, when, it, when they know a storm is coming, whether it's a hurricane, tornado, storm, anything, uh, they're better than any meteorologist uh, out there in reading the weather. Uh, when the barometer changes, 
the barometric pressure. They know a storm is coming. But you know what they do? They go deeper. Sharks go deeper. Fish, they go deeper. Because if they stay on the surface, if they stay on the surface, they're going to get tossed around in the waves. And that's just like us. If we were just go deeper in our relationship with Jesus Christ, no storm would ever be able to touch us. It doesn't mean you're not going to be able to, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to go through it. But what it does mean is that we can walk through it with Jesus and we don't have to be fearful. We don't have to worry and we don't have, definitely don't have to have anxiety. Because he is our hope and he is our promise. How deep is your relationship with Jesus? I'm not a perfect man in this. I got work to do, but I strive to go deeper. I want to be tight with the Lord. I don't want to, I don't want to high and buy a relationship. I do, uh, <laughs> I, got a, I got a video. I want to, I want to kind of try to drive this home a little bit. Um, I do want to give you a disclaimer, though. It does deal with nature. Uh, it, it seems like we're in a National Geographic thing, but... Um, it does deal with animals, um, and there is going to be some fighting, uh, but there is no blood or gore or anything like that. But if, that, if you don't like that kind of thing, close your eyes, and if you don't want your kids to see this kind of thing, uh, feel free. I'm going to give you some time to go ahead and step out. Okay. <laughs> All right, you ready? I'm going to do my best to commentate this thing. Now, I'm no Morgan Freeman, so work with me. Some of y'all look like that this morning, not enough coffee. And so imagine yourself as this lion, and you're going through life, and, and, and things are okay for the moment, but then you find yourself getting hit by life. Now those hyenas could be your kids, it could be your job, it could be the things of this world, the things you're chasing, and you're fighting for your life, and you're tired, you're wore out from the week. Don't know where to go, don't know where to turn, turn to, which problem you should attack first. And then start closing in. And you're doing your best, your best to stand your ground. getting pulled in every different direction and you're getting swarmed by life you have no peace and you're fighting you're trying to tackle one thing at a time you're doing this all in your own strength Everything in this world is trying to get your attention and trying to pull at you in every different way. But when you finally come to the end of trying to do everything on your own and you're trying to, and you're finally coming to the place where you're saying, listen, I need a savior, and you call on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he answers your prayer, and the line of Judah shows up in your life. Your problems begin to run. Although they may still be there, you can still have peace, knowing that Jesus has answered your prayer, and that he is with you, that he will never leave you or forsake you. And it comes back to a love that is so deep. And he says, I love you. I love you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I think that is absolutely stunning. Everything comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me. This brings me to our second point, and then we'll close. Through Jesus Christ, we can have peace with God. 
through Jesus Christ, we can have not only the peace of God, but we can have the peace with God. But there was a problem before Jesus came on the scene, there, 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 and it's still a problem even today. And you, this may be you today, that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and, and you're not too sure what this even looks like, and we're going to get into this. Is, this is exactly why we need a Savior, is because our sin has separated us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 says this. He says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, it's not that God has become dull to our prayers. It's potentially because we have become dull to prayer. Our sins have separated us from God. We became enemies with God the moment that sin has entered into the world. But through Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled back to God for all eternity. And it is really about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is a hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says this. If you do not know what some of these sins are, maybe you're living in them now. You have to determine for yourself. But I'm going to give you this list according to Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're told in the book of James that he who knows what is right to do and does not do it commits sin. And so if you are a believer in Jesus, you may not have peace in your life because you're living this way according to the sins of the flesh. And I want to encourage you to just turn to the Lord with repentance. You can say you're sorry. That just means you're sorry. True repentance requires action. So I want to encourage you to do that. And we're going to have a moment uh, here shortly. And we'll pray with you over those things if that's where you're at. But you may be here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And these things all look good and these things are fun. You may enjoy some of these things, but the fact is, is that's not the will of God for your life. And maybe deep down inside, you know that you don't have peace with your life. You don't have peace with the way you go about doing things. You don't want to hate people. Revelation 21, 27, it says this, nothing impure will ever enter it. It's talking about heaven. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, when your name is written in the book of life, nothing's, nothing can take it away. When it's there, it's there. But you cannot get there. You cannot get your name in the book of life unless it's through Jesus Christ. He says, no man come to me except, no man, no man can get to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our portion. He is the only way that can get you to heaven. He can, he's the only way that can save your soul. I got a, we got a little gift for you at the close of service. It's a little keychain, nothing much. But for those of you who believe in Jesus Christ, may this serve as a reminder to you that the next time you're facing a storm, that the next time your your peace is being uh, taken from you, the next time that you're facing financial hardship, illness in the family, whatever that is for you, may this be a reminder to you that with prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, you can have peace. May this be a reminder to you that Jesus conquered the grave and he conquered sin. May this be a reminder to you that he is with you and he will never forsake you. He will never forsake you. You may be here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your name may not be written in the book of life. You can have an opportunity to to come forward and confess the name of Jesus Christ. That your life would change forevermore. want you to have one too. And may this serve you as a reminder 
that Jesus loves you so much that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins so you can be reconciled back to God, that he didn't leave you in this world as an orphan. But he is a good, good father, and he wants to adopt you into the beloved. That you don't have to live the way that you're living. You don't have to go through what you're going through all on your own. We've all been there. In fact, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Paul says, Paul says it's not, Jesus is not a license to continue on sitting. Where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. But shall we continue on sinning that grace may abound? No. Let's keep in step in repentance. If you have a decision to make for Jesus, would you come? And as we stand and sing this song of invitation, we're going to have prayer counselors right here. Hey guys, we're so glad you plugged into this week's message. We want to connect with you. Check us out at cornerstonechurch.co. Can't wait to see you next weekend.